This is Erin from Spooky Crimes, and you are listening to My Stuttering Life podcast, hosted by Pedro Pena. So let's get started. What's up, guys? This is Pedro from My Stuttering Life, where you will hear the good, the bad, the very ugly. We're going to laugh. We're going to cry, but through it all, just know that you are not alone. So let's get started. This is episode number 41, and my featured guest is Jalisa Bygrave. Ms. Bygrave is a social worker from Toronto, Ontario, who has worked in the profession since 2011. She has a breadth of experience supporting individuals, children, and families with complex needs. She works as a prison social worker on a full-time basis and is starting a social work private practice part-time for persons with various speech impediments. This stems from her own personal experiences living with a stutter. I am honored to have her as a guest with me on my stuttering life. Welcome, Jalisa Bygrave. Thank no, thank you so much for having me on the show. I'm a bit nervous, but also really excited to talk about my own experiences and also to talk about um, my latest private practice venture in the context of this interview. So, yeah, no, I'm ready to jump in. <laughs> That is great. And you don't have to be nervous. We are family, so it's all good. (laughs) (laughs) No, you're very, you seem very easy to talk to and and you do bring that family vibe in your communication style. So I'm feeling more and more comfortable already. So that's good. Thank you so much. There will be a big paycheck in the mail for you. So. Ah, yes, I'm excited. I can use it. <laughs> Lots of bills coming up. <laughs> um, okay, I was just kidding, but let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So when do you remember when you first began to stutter? What I do remember is I remember going to the, like, when I was really young, maybe around two or three years old, I remember going to hospital appointments with my mom because we actually grew up in Montreal. Quebec before moving to Toronto, where I am presently. But I remember um, her taking me to to the hospital when we were in Montreal. And I remember meeting with like a professional and we were playing with toys. We were reading sentences. But at that time, I didn't understand why I was going to these appointments, like why this was was happening. I thought maybe like some sort of daycare or or something like that. But now looking back when a a bit, bit older now, um, I realized I was working with a speech language pathologist who was assisting me with the management of of my stutter, actually. I think I have better recollections of when I was a child and, and adolescent living with a stutter. And, and I remember that specifically in the context of school. I remember not having many friends during the course of my time because I think there's a lot of stigma towards me because I was I would stutter a lot more and also I was in a special education program at at school from grade one up until grade seven so I think when I was a ch- I guess when I was a bit like a child like a school age child that's when I started really remembering that I that I had a, had a stuttering problem does it run in your family do you have any other family members who stutter actually it's just myself I'm the only one so at times I did feel intimidated by that because my family members can just speak so flawlessly and so clearly, whereas I was the one who struggled in that area quite a bit. So I did feel a sense of shame because I couldn't speak like them. I felt inadequate because I was the special one who needed, and I, and I, and I use air quotes when I say special, right? Because I felt like I was the one that needed the extra support. Like I mentioned before, I was in the special education program. And I I have a younger sister who, who like during her school, she was very intelligent and very, and excelled in academics. And I did envy her at times. And I wish I could be like her and not have a starting problem and not be in special education courses. So the stigma was very much internalized on, on my end. Wow. I think we we are twins because I felt, <laughs> 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 no, it's true. I felt the 
the same way. Now, my mom had told me that when she was younger, she stuttered, but she told me that one day she just told herself, I'm stopping, and she stopped. Um, And so I always thought, wow, she is a strong woman. I mean, she's like a wonder woman. <laughs> but growing up, my brothers, you know, they all had quote unquote, perfect speech. And like you, I was the only one who wasn't able to talk. I could not s- s- say my name. And there was a, a, a lot of shame and guilt with mm-hmm. me that I carried, oh my gosh, for decades, for decades. Mm-hmm. You were talking about in grade school, you were in speech therapy. Was it helpful? I thought it was quite helpful. And I want to give my mom a ton of credit in this moment right now, because around that time period, I felt as if there's a lot of stigma towards like learning and developmental challenges that children can potentially face, right? And sometimes because parents are so stigmatized by that, that they don't put their children to any kind of services or programs to address those pieces. Whereas my mom, and because and, and, I, I, was, I was born in the late 80s, late 80s, like, so around, around that time, the attitude towards learning disabilities is, is not what it is right now where it's more more evolved. So I appreciate that my mom was able to um, move past that stigma and say, hey, Julissa, you need the support. I'm gonna put you into speech pathology services right away. I'm gonna make sure that you're in special education classes from a very young age to ensure that you can eventually catch up and get the skills that you need to thrive later in in life. So I I'm so grateful to her for for not neglecting my needs and making that a priority from the get-go as soon as she recognized that there was an, an issue at, at play there. So, um, so I, think speech, I think speech therapy is very, I, I think it's, a, it's essential if you start it early, early on and not, not wait a, a, around it. Right. You have a wonderful mother. Oh my gosh. She is hashtag awesome. She is yeah. just hashtag yep. on the ball and she noticed it and she just hopped on it. That, that is just awesome. Oh, wow. So in high school, what was it like for you in high school as a stutterer? Well, I ended up being one of those people that kept to myself and I maintained a very small circle of friends because I was very introverted and I'm still am introverted now, but it looks a bit different than it did at, at that point in my life. I think my experience as a person who stutters coupled with being a racialized black woman, black woman resulted in diminished level of confidence and self-perception of myself. I never even dated anyone in, in high school at all. I, I, and looking back, I don't think I was ready because I think I needed to work through those pieces around building self-confidence within myself. And I think I needed to figure out who I was um, before I, I took that step of, of dating. But but basically in high school, I just really kept to myself because I saw myself as inferior and I saw myself as, as inadequate. Yeah, I didn't have too many friends because of that. And also I think maybe because people thought that I was a bit of a um, I guess I guess maybe an an odd oddball because of my um, stutter and 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 whatnot. So yeah, many people that I talk to regarding their high school life experiences, many of them joined like groups like sports to help them get out of their comfort z- zone. Many joined clubs, various clubs. Like in my case, the um, drama club in high school, they welcomed me in and that was the only place in high school that I fit in because like 
you were talking about, people in school thought that I was very odd because I didn't have many friends. I may have had one, possibly two. And so <laughs> the drama club kids, they were the only people who were extremely supportive. They would always be in my corner and help me and support me and cheer me on. And that was how I got over my fear, kind of, sort of, of being on stage. Did you join any groups in high school to help you with your stutter? To be honest, I stayed away from clubs in high school partially because of that, because I felt a bit of anxiety associated with living with, with a stutter. So I did shy away from those opportunities. I think when I started going to universities, when I started feeling more confident and more sure of myself and started putting myself in situations that are traditionally uncomfortable for an introverted, anxious person like myself. Um, and I think the university environment was better at cultivating that comfort level than the high school environment would be. Cause like there are times in high school where I was often underestimated by my peers and by teachers. And I still remember something very vividly from like my guidance counselor when I was trying to figure out what, uni like, what university or college to go to after high school. And then she told me, just settle for, for college. Like, don't even bother going to university. So I think that's like one example of how the high school environment stymies a person like myself into f um, fulfilling their full potential. I told my dad about the, that encounter with my guidance counselor the next day, and he was absolutely livid because he can see that I have more to offer than what the high school environment said I had to offer. So once I got, eventually I, I didn't listen to when I applied to university and I got in. And then when I started going to university, that's when I felt like there was more things at place to encourage people like myself to go out of their box, go out of their, sh get out of their shell. And I think that's when I started experiencing that growth and started taking part in more organizations like social justice advocacy groups on campus, like feminist clubs, um, political organizations and things like that. Yeah, so I, I wouldn't give high school credit for that, but university for sure. <laughs> many, many, many people, they, they underestimate us, people who mm -hmm. stutter. Let me tell you, there are doctors who stutter. There are politicians who stutter. There are business professionals who stutter. Winston mm -hmm. Churchill, he stuttered. Marilyn Monroe, Bruce Willis, my favorite, Samuel L. Jackson, but, you know, <laughs> he dropped some F-bombs <laughs> every other word. <laughs> I can't really do that as a coping technique, but, <laughs> but I love me some Mr. Samuel L. Jackson. Oh, he's awesome. <laughs> he, he, he is awesome. And there is also that common misconception that people who stutter are less than. And we are not. We are mm -hmm. strong individuals. We are brave. I mean, we have to fight every single day. Well, um, in my case, I fight every single day to be fluent. Now, mm -hmm. I have my good days. I have my bad days. But every single day, I have to work five times harder than everybody else who is a quote unquote normal speaker. Um, and mm -hmm. so one of the common bonds that we all have is that we are very underestimated. Absolutely. Now, do you have any advice for parents and teachers regarding children who stutter? Yeah, for parents, I, I would say, you know what, every child will have their host of issues when they're, when they're growing up. It could be learning, could be developmental, it could be behavioral, it could be in terms of mental health, could be, could be anything, right? Could be weight issues, who, who knows, right? 
but don't let your perception of that issue impact what decision you make for your child in terms of getting help, in terms of getting support, right? Because when it comes to the parent-child relationship in general, the parent almost always has the upper hand with uh, like with that relationship. So there's a power imbalance there. And, 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 and that's going to be present until the child gets to an age where they can become self-sufficient. Therefore, the parent does hold a significant responsibility in ensuring that the child gets the support that they deserve to get. So with my mom, she didn't hesitate to get me into speech pathology and into special education courses. She just hopped right on it because she didn't let the stigma towards my situation impact how she was going to proceed and, and act in terms of um, supporting me. She just said, like, you know what, Jaleesa can benefit from this, so Jaleesa's going to get the help. And obviously, I benefited from that because I finished my bachelor's of social work. I also got my master's in social work. I have a really good good job. I I have a home investment. So I've done really well. So I want to give her a ton of credit for that. So that's what I'm saying to parents. It's imperative that you put your feelings aside. Don't don't project your stigma onto the to the to the child because it's just only protecting your own insecurities and it's and it affects the child in the long run. In terms of teachers, I would say just be very patient with with children that that stutter, right? Because sometimes they don't only have the stutter as their is their only issue. They contend with other issues in their in their life, right? Because some of them could come from a home where there's there's a lot of poverty taking place. Maybe there's violence in the home between the, the caregivers. Maybe maybe there's like there's there's an illness in in the in the family too. Like maybe someone else in the family family has cancer. Like, but basically what I'm trying to say is that the stuttering is is one issue, but there's also a host of other things that may be going on in their life. So I encourage t- teachers to be patient with with the child because those emotions are going to com- come out when you're working with them. So have that understanding of that. For me as a person who stutters, I also had to deal with being a Black female in a society where white privilege is a pervasive thing at play and that impacts what opportunities I have access to in terms of jobs, school, and other facets, right? So um, I just encourage teachers to see the whole picture of a child's life story to get to a place where you can build deeper empathy for the child and be able to support their holistic needs. And from and from there, that's how you can support someone who who does live with a stutter by understanding their their whole entire life as it is wow that is awesome advice i took down a lot of notes (laughs) (laughs) that was great advice Ooh, i got goosebumps (laughs) that that's why i think my practice is very important because i think I want to touch upon these things for people that stutter because it's not just a stutter that they're dealing with. It's other things in their life that's taking place. So I feel like there needs to be more emotionally supportive services that take that into consideration. That's why I'm trying to get this private practice off the ground and get it, get it out there for people to take advantage of. That is just awesome. Speaking of careers, had you ever um, experienced job discrimination because of your stutter? Absolutely. Um, I feel that people question my knowledge and capacity to do my job in general because of my tendency to stutter and speak very fast. I know for myself, I speak very fast because I can feel a stutter coming. coming. So then I, I speak rapidly to, to mask the stutter that might come, come out when I'm speaking. But anyhow, um, we live in a world where I feel like the extrovert personality is is more favored, and I'm not extroverted, and and I'm, I'm introverted, and I'm totally okay with that, and I don't have any desire to to change that part of my of myself. And sometimes being an introvert is, is seen as some sort of deficit per se, right? 
So part of the reason why I am introverted is because I have this, this stutter and I still feel a bit of stigma around that. So for example, staff meetings make me nervous. And when I'm nervous, I do stutter and I do ramble more. And then people in the staff meeting hear that and then they start to question my ability to do my job based on how I communicate in these meetings. And then I internalize these perceptions of me as an employee. I can recall a time when I was um, doing my master's degree and I had to do a, a placement to fulfill the obligations of that degree program. Um, I was in a research-based placement at a hospital where I guess I had to be more talkative and and engage through through um, participating in staff meetings because um, we have like research project meetings. So I would have to talk more. Um, my place of supervisor, she absolutely um, grilled me for not being able to s speak enough in these meetings, even though my research report writing skills were impeccable and other staff who read my reports were very impressed with how I would would, would write these reports because they can see a lot, of, like, a lot of high language being used, a lot of analysis and interpretation of the research and, and so forth. So she harped on me, my supervisor, for not talking enough and said that I was not performing at a at a like a at great sorry, at a graduate level, graduate student level, which did hurt me very much because she didn't take the time to understand my point of view and why I'm not someone that likes to talk a lot in meetings and why I, I can kick ass at writing, but when it comes to speaking in front of people in the meeting, it's still, it still is daunt, daunting for me. So she didn't understand my social location, where I was coming from and why I, I am the way that I am. So it was a really hard placement for me to, to complete, but just to me reaffirms how discrimination can happen in an employment context, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Oh my God. We are twins. Let me tell you, we're twins <laughs> because, ooh, let me tell you, when I was doing my master's practicum, now, granted, in college, I was pre law, and everyone knows this. When I was in pre law, because I loved watching those lawyer TV shows, I would pr practice at home. I object. And I mean, I just love. <laughs> <laughs> I loved all those TV shows. So I had it in my head that I was going to be a lawyer. So in college, I was uh, pre-law. And then one weekend, I watched this movie. I don't know if if you have watched it, but it's called My Cousin Vinny. No, I haven't seen it, actually. Oh, okay. This is your homework. Your okay. <laughs> <laughs> I want you to watch that movie. And there is a moment in that movie where one of the attorneys has a severe speech impediment. Mm. And when the judge tells him to give his opening statement, I mean, it all looks, quote unquote, normal. He walks up there. I mean, I'm just picturing just this is an, an everyday occurrence. And when he opened his mouth, OMG, let me tell you, he had a most severe stutter. And the people in the um, in the jury box, they were looking at him with their mouth open, like in shock. And then the stuttering lawyer was spitting on people <laughs> in the jury, <laughs> you know, on accident, because you know, I've been there. And so watching that on the big screen, my heart, it sank all the way into my left foot. And so I thought, that's not going to be Pedro. No, that's not going to be Pedro. And so that Monday morning, I went into the counselor's office and switched from pre-law to psychology. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Because I thought, let me help people, you know, in a different way. And so fast forward to doing my master's practicum in human resources, because my master's is in IO psychology. That is, mm -hmm. 
that's um industrial um organizational psychology so basically group dynamics so during my master's practicum they had me in every department in human resources and oh my gosh like you we would have meetings and they would ask me questions and i just froze i nothing came out and my eyes got so big they thought there was something wrong with me and then on conference Ooh. calls so people know who know me when they call me i have a hard time with my ages you know it's like heavy breathing <sighs> and so <laughs> so as we were doing the conference calls and it was my turn to speak all they heard was <sighs> <sighs> <laughs> like what's going on here <laughs> exactly everybody was mortified <laughs> so so you know there were extremely horrible days during that master's practicum and and people thought what is wrong with that individual why is he even here but granted i got over it i got my a thank you mayor's office i got my a <laughs> But I know ex I know ex how you f feel because it also happened to me. So yes, oof. Let me ask you this: during the course of your life experiences, had you ever fallen um, into a depression because of your stuttering? Um. Well. Maybe not just because of the stuttering and isolation, but because of other factors that were at play in in my life. Because I have a stutter, I have a deep voice. Sometimes when I talk on the phone with people, people call me sir because they think I'm a, a male. Um, also because of being a black woman too, as well, and that not seeing as like the standard of of beauty within society in general. So I think all those things coming together all at once. Um, I did feel um, sentiments of inadequacy um, at points in my life. And I do have a, I do live with a generalized anxiety disorder too. Um, so managing that was also another piece I had to contend with. So I think just a combination of different things that was taking place in my life did create those sentiments of feeling depressed at certain moments in my life. Um, thank goodness for, um, I guess, going getting, going to therapy and getting, getting the help to see who I was past those labels that I've affixed to myself over time in my life. I think that was very key for me and um, overcoming that. Listening to your thoughtful answer, the thoughts in my head are, that has happened to me also. Mm -hmm. Granted, um, I don't have a deep voice, and I have been told during a drive through ma'am, please drive up. And <laughs> <laughs> so I think we're opposite twins because, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I tried to have that deep voice, but <laughs> that's just that's just not who I am. I would love to have the voice of. James Earl Jones, you know, this mm -hmm. is CNN. I would, <laughs> I would love to have that so voice. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not reality. This is my voice. And like you, I <laughs> have been called the opposite gender during a drive through during a telephone conversation. So I, like you, I just have to go with it and tell myself, Okay, let's just move past this and just keep moving forward. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't, if you think about it and think about it, you know, it will get you down. And so I just would just tell myself, uh, you had a bad day and let's just move on. Mm -hmm. Now, many people that I have spoken to over the years, they tell me, that they had to self-medicate 
to help them with their stutter. Was that the case with you? No, absolutely not. And I say this because like, I come from a cultural background, like my family's um, Jamaican. So I guess those things around like using drugs, that was something that was highly frowned upon within the community and in general. And then my parents carried those values very highly and very strongly as well. So that wasn't something that that gravitated that I gravitated towards in terms of a coping strategy. I guess for for me is is, is more just self isolation and and negative self talk. That was what what I I, I guess I I, I did, to, did to myself. So so in that way, is, is, is that still harmful? as a as a drug can be to your body but harmful manifesting in a different way right because the negative self-talk that that i was preoccupied with did 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 did, uh, like work to hurt me hurt me um but not in the same way that a drug would but it still had that kind of impact if that makes sense yes it does now did you name your negative self-talk because I had that growing up my entire life, I would tell myself, you are dumb. Nobody wants to hang around you. You can't even talk. Nobody wants to be your friend. Just shut up. And so I named my negative voice later in life. I called him Oscar. Because, oh. <laughs> yes, growing up, we would watch um, Sesame Street, there was, you know, Big Bird and, you know, Cookie Monster. And there was also Oscar the Grouch. And everything that came out of his mouth was negative, hurtful, and mean. Um, and so mm-hmm. I took that and named my negative s- s- self-talk. Um, I named it Oscar. And there are days when Oscar will rear his ugly head (laughs) and tell me just stay home you can't talk on the phone and that's when I tell Oscar to shut up I tell him (laughs) I don't need you today thanks but no thanks I got this did you name your negative self talk I never give it a name, but I think that I can see how that was helpful for you in that in that moment, right? Because um, by 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 naming it, you're owning that it's it's there and, and it's present, and that and that it's it's it, it shouldn't be present in your life. And um, I've, I I never thought to <laughs> I never thought to do that, but that's smart on your end to to come up with that idea. <laughs> well, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> During your years of speech therapy, what what was the most effective technique that you learned and had used? I think for me was learning to first gather my my thoughts first before um, saying something. So, for example, when it ca- came to staffing, because I still have to do them in my in my work every so often, whether I like it or not. Um, so when I anticipate that I'm going to be going to a meeting, I write notes down in a book. So talking points that helps me. So then I, cause, cause I'm not someone that can speak off the cuff and, and, and like speak on a, on, on a whim like that. I need to think about what I say before it comes out of my mouth. So I think that was a helpful technique for me to learn. And I know, and I know myself when I try to speak off the cuff like more freestyle then I'm at a greater likelihood of speaking very rapidly and then rambling on because I because my thoughts are a bit slower than 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 my than my speech so I need that time to write things down so then so so then when I go to these meetings I feel more prepared and I feel more confident in the process how cool that I never thought about but when you were talking I was writing down that that golden nugget. So thank you very much for that. <laughs> no, no problem. <laughs> now, let me ask you the $1 million question. 
Okay, I get asked this all the time. And so I want to ask you, do you let others finish your sentences for you? I it's not to like let them, they, they just go ahead and, and they do it <laughs> without <laughs> ask, asking you, which is a bit frustrating. I I don't like it because I feel like we live in a society where things have to happen rapidly, really fast. So when I'm speaking and I'm taking my time, people are buying into that mentality of getting things dealt with quickly by finishing my sentences. And that to me becomes frustrating because it sends a message that I'm incapable of, of communicating and I'm going too slow for you. And that does, that, that does make me feel inadequate at times. And, and I see where the person's coming from. They think that they're trying to be helpful but it's like when you when you hold the door for someone, sometimes they don't want you to hold the door for them. But in your mind, you think it's you're being helpful, but they may not see it as such. So I think this applies in this case where people try to finish their sentences thinking that you, they're helping you, but they're having the opposite effect on, on you and your self-perception. Wow. The um, answers that I have received is just split right down the middle 50 50 oh really yes with me before i turned 40 because i'm a little older than you before <laughs> <laughs> before i turned 40 i would have people help me out because when i'm having a block i turn red I don't breathe. So I would appreciate, you know, not passing out and falling to the floor <laughs> <laughs> and have somebody call 911. <laughs> that isn't a good look for me. And so I would have people help me out and, and finish my thoughts. Now, after I turned 40, 40 was a pivotal point in my life because I told myself, I'm done. I am done fighting this stutter. I'm going to embrace it. I'm going to welcome it into my life because stuttering is exhausting mm -hmm. mentally, physically, psychologically. It's just, I mean, it drains you. And my typical day you know, from 5 a.m. until 5 p.m., my body is tense for 12 hours. It is tense because I've been stuttering, and stammering, and blocking, and trying to breathe. When I get home, I kid you not, I am completely drained. I just sit on the couch, and most days I pass out because I'm tired from the day, <laughs> but... Yeah. For 12 hours, I had been stuttering and blocking and not breathing, and every organ in my body was tense. And so coming home, I mean, I was, I didn't want to do anything because I was physically and mentally drained. So after I turned 40, I told myself, I don't care anymore. I don't. I don't give a rat's patootie what you think about my stutter or what others think about my stutter. I'm Pedro. I stutter. And guess what? Life goes on. Once I did that, it was a huge weight had been lifted from me. And from mm -hmm. that day onward, oh, it was awesome. I didn't care what people were talking about me because of my stutter, because I told myself, they don't pay my bills. They don't know me. They are not in my circle of friends. And that was a pivotal point in my life because now I'm 48. And so eight years after that, oh my gosh, it has been just hashtag awesome. I don't <laughs> care if I can't talk on the phone. If I'm Heavy breathing. Oh, well, call 911. Call the police. I don't care. <laughs> I just have a stutter and the world is not going to stop because I can't say my name. It's not. Now, let me ask you this because th th this has 
really helped me grow as a person who stutters. What are your thoughts of stepping out of your comfort zone? Hmm. It's, it's scary at times, right? Because you're putting yourself out there, your flaws and all for the world to, to see and to potentially criticize. So it does invoke a sense of anxiety on my end, but it also can be reaffirming because once you put yourself out there and you, and you get the positive results. So for example, um, for me, public speaking, something that was an ongoing and it still is an ongoing challenge for me, but the more that I do it, the more I feel like, wow, I, I, I did that. And it wasn't as bad as I initially perceived it to be. It's still not my favorite thing to do, but, but it's, it just shows me that it's not impossible for me to do. So stepping out of that comfort zone can be helpful in terms of boosting your own self-perception and challenging things that you may initially think that like, oh, I can't do this. I can't do that. But then once you do it, you're like, hey, I did it and I excelled. What else, what else can I do that I haven't tried before and can potentially excel in later on? Right. That is an awesome answer because when I would do it, step out of my comfort zone, knowing that I'm going to have a challenge. But when I did it without stuttering, I thought, oh my gosh, this was a win. This was a W for Pedro and it feels good. Mm -hmm. So I would do it the following day. And let's say I had another win. That helped me, according to John Maxwell, he has a great book on the laws of attraction. There's a law called the law of momentum. With each win, that helped me build momentum and, and confidence to handle the next task. And so now I tell myself that I need to keep doing it that way I can continue to grow as an individual and to help me as a stutterer. So pretty cool. <laughs> no, it is, it is neat. Now, this is an interesting question because all of the answers are just split right down the middle. When you are alone, can you speak without stuttering? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I have conversations with my cat, Benny, all the time. Even though they're one-sided, I could speak flawlessly and perfectly um, without um, stammering into some sort of stutter in the process. No, so it's, I find it easy because I guess there's not much pressure. And of course, my cat won't give me any, any kind of pressure <laughs> to speak a certain way. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, it's, it's perfect when I'm not around other people. Well, cats will give you attitude, but, you know, I'm yeah. in their own special way. <laughs> 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 That's just my two cents. Now, <laughs> when I do it, I still stutter. And so, you know, I told people when I'm alone, I stutter. When I'm in the shower, I stutter. I mean, you know, it's just how I am. And so we're all different. So this is a topic that always comes up. I mean, with every body who has a speech impediment. Okay. Picture this. You are walking to a doctor's appointment and you walk into the office and you approach the front desk person and they tell you, good morning, what's your name? And you are having a block. You know, it's a fairly long block and you may be <laughs> trying to breathe. And then after a while, the front desk person will ask you, did you forget your name? <laughs> <laughs> Has it ever happened to you? And if it did, how did you respond? 
that's never happened to me. Like, it's more the opposite where I say my name and then they don't understand what I'm saying because the name is not very common for them. So, so then they mispronounce it and I say, no, it's Jalisa. And then <clears throat> I have to repeat a couple of times before um, they, they understand <laughs> what my name actually is. So I, I guess that's more the frustration for me personally when I'm introducing myself to other, other people is having to deal with the repetition of my own name. Wow. <laughs> lucky, lucky, lucky you. <laughs> <laughs> now, previously, you were talking about your career path. And during the um, introduction, you work in the prison system. We are twins because my background was in the jails and prisons. And so I know exactly what you were going through in those prison system. So talk about how did your career path as a person who stutter led you to what you do now? So I think it's, for me, it started when, um, in, in high school, I was, as I mentioned, I was very interested, not much of a talker, but I was always a pretty good listener. So when my friends had issues that they wanted to um, bring forth to someone, I was the go-to person for that purpose. And I, and, I, and I liked that because part of that was because it was a way for me to deflect from looking into my own life and my own issues by focusing on other people's um, circumstances. So I figured, you know what? I might as well get get paid for it since I'm so good at it. So that's why I embarked on the path of going into um, the school of social work, and and then I got my bachelor's degree. But through the program, I was taking part in the program. I felt that I developed more confidence in myself as a person because the social work profession is about understanding and embracing diversity and people of different backgrounds and experiences. So through the program, I was able to get more insight into my own um, identity and really started to embrace and, and appreciate that. So as I was developing that, I started to take on more risk from a professional standpoint and take on more challenging job opportunities in the field because the program had prepared me for that by giving me great professional as well as personal development opportunities in the context of, of my studies. Um, I also, I previously worked in the children's aid. I think in the U.S. they call it child protective services. I've also worked with children and families affected by HIV. And I also worked with people that lived in disadvantaged, poverty-stricken communities from a community outreach perspective. And I think those opportunities helped prepare me for the job that I'm doing now as a jail social worker because I've been exposed to so much from a professional and personal point of view that has developed me into a person that I can work in the jail system. And I've been doing this for well over a year, a year now, and I still enjoy the job very much. How cool. That is awesome. Now, let's switch gears and let's talk about dating. So Ooh. let me tell you. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Uh -oh. Next on Oprah. No. So <laughs> dating is hard as a general role. But if you are a person who stutters, <laughs> just pile <laughs> on <laughs> the extra pressure, the extra this, the extra that. How was dating for you as a person who stutters? Well, I think it's still an ongoing challenge for me. Um, but I remember in my mid-20s, that's when I actually started dating because I just felt not confident and ready to take that step before then. Um, but I remember when I first started, uh, I used to be so just awkward as as a person. And I was just so unsure of myself and still trying to figure out who I was. So because of that pressure, it, it, I guess my stutter would, would come out more when I when I would go on dates because I was just so anxious about living with a stutter and also just not fully realized and confident in myself as a as a person. And 
sometimes in dates, I feel like I would have to overcompensate by discussing my academic accomplishments, places I've traveled to, jobs I've held, restaurants I've tried. So I feel like I have to like sell myself more so than maybe someone that doesn't stutter because I think I felt like the more that I sold my 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 personal resume as I guess as you may want to say it, I guess the better I presented as a prospective dating candidate. That's the that was the logic that I was working with. But I guess over time as I developed more confidence in myself as a person, then the stutter became less pronounced in dates because I was more I was more sure of myself. And I think there's a correlation between my anxiety and confidence and my predisposition to stuttering. Is this, and this does uh, manifest itself in terms of the dating context. Um, I, I think I'm a lot better now at dating than I was in my 20s, but it's still sometimes a work in progress, I think. <laughs> Oh yes, it is. There should be a a dating app for just people who stutter. We can yes. just <laughs> we can just <laughs> swipe left, right, up, down. I mean, it doesn't really matter. Just <laughs> just help us out. Come on, technology. <laughs> hey, you should you should um, propose that. Get on that. Start getting that app going. <laughs> wow, that is a million dollar idea. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of t t technology, because during my day, okay, you are very young. So, you know, in my day, we had a regular telephone that was attached to the wall that had a very long cord. <laughs> Back in my day, you would have to use that telephone for everything to call and ask about this or to order a pizza or whatnot. Nowadays, we have our phones, we have t t technology to help us. We can download an app and we can, we can order a meal and then have it come t to our door. We prepay, you know, that's all done for us. Do you think that this is helpful or do you think it is a crutch? I think in some ways it could be helpful, especially if you're not necessarily comfortable talking on, on the phone all, all the time. Cause I, I'm someone that doesn't like having phone conversations and I, and I prefer to text because I guess there's that le there's less pressure in terms of stuttering in in the process of communication because you can't really stutter through text obviously, but I guess in, in other ways too, then it inhibits us in terms of putting ourselves out there and and challenging those those situations that make us nervous that makes that makes us nervous and, and anxious. So then we we avoid it completely, right? So I guess in some ways this culture that we live in, this environment where technology is more at the forefront, it, it, it does encourage us to go revert back to our shells. So I guess it's, there's a, there's, there are pros and there are cons as well. So I, I don't know what the right, right answer is. I can appreciate both sides of the coin, if that makes sense. Right. Right. Do you have a, Google Home or or possibly the Amazon Echo? No, I'm not. I'm not that um, <laughs> up to date with the, the technology. <laughs> I, I do the simple things like in, maybe Instagram or or WhatsApp, but I don't go that far far beyond when it comes to these technological innovations that are out there. Right. My um, only complaint regarding this new technology um, is that most of these helpful aids, they start with a letter that I cannot say. And ah. so <laughs> my G's, my G's are gu -gu 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 -gu, And then I have a hard time with my A's and my E's and don't get me started on the S because yeah. the letter S is my nemesis. Let me tell you. <laughs> Like a tire going flat. That's how I do my S's. 
<laughs> the lessons are hard though i i, I get that <laughs> they are and people don't understand i mean we <laughs> we struggle with letters and trying to get the words that are in our head trying to get them out so you know the struggle is real hashtag the struggle is real <laughs> heck yeah <laughs> see s's <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to breathe. So what has stuttering taught you? For me, it's taught me that I am enough as I am. I have a stutter. That's my reality. It's not going to go away. I can pr practice things that can help me in terms of its management, but it's a part of who I am, right? It's like someone that lives with diabetes, for example. It's, it's going to be a part of their life for the rest of their, their life, but there's ways to, to manage that so they can still live a long, healthy, fulfilling life in the same way. This is what I, what I live with, so what I contend with. And in, in light of that, I'm still enough. I'm still a worthy individual anyhow. How cool. Yes, you are. Hashtag you are. <laughs> <laughs> now, so, ooh, those S's. All right. We're going to breathe. So what advice would you give to another person who stutters? I think back to myself to, as, a, as a person who stutters. I'm always someone that tries to tackle issues on my own, and I never sought help. But it's okay to ask for help and to tell people what you need, what you need from them, right? So um it being in a society where certain communication style is 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 praised and championed um i tried so hard to fit into that but in the process i'm ne i'm neglecting who i am in my experiences so just telling people that like hey i need you to not finish my my sentences let me get at it when i can hey i don't feel comfortable um presenting this much this this much like if I'm doing like a group assignment for example and I don't feel comfortable having like a, a large chunk of the presentation part just saying hey can I do more of the writing behind the scenes and then you can you can do the presentation the bulk of it and then people people will will um support you if if they're good kind hearted genuine people that they will find ways to to understand and support you if you just ask them what you need. So if they're good people, they'll they'll understand you, right? Um, right. So so that's why I I feel so strongly about this private practice that I'm trying to start, right? Because I think there are a lot of people out there that do live with various speech impediments, like a like a stutter, and 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 they're probably internalizing that, and they're suffering emotionally and maybe not getting the emotional help like they're probably going to speech pathology appointments and getting support for how to how to deal with the stutter from a practical standpoint but then the emotional standpoint gets neglected right because there's a lot of stigma that one has to contend with in different parts of life as we touched upon in terms of dating employment school and i think this opportunity for me to start this private practice will give people a platform to discuss those issues in a safe, supportive environment, because I'm not sure where else they can go to do that. So that's why I feel so strongly about my practice that, I, that I'm calling Your Voice Speech Challenges Counseling, because I want it to be a source where people can go to to get the emotional support. Wow, that is just awesome. I mean, that is just, whew. My heart is full, let me tell you. <laughs> I would like to thank you for spending this time with me. I want to thank you for telling your story because I believe there's healing in sharing. Mm -hmm. And you are hashtag courageous. You are hashtag awesome. Mm -hmm. And I am just... I am honored to just have you here w on this podcast talking about your story because I tell everybody you are not alone. We all have a common bond that, yes, we do have a stutter, 
But you are not alone because there are other people who have been in your shoes and who have experienced what you have experienced. Because I believe that if we can all come together and talk about our life experiences as people who stutter, we can help each other out. Yeah, I, I'm a huge proponent of mutual aid and mutual support, right? Because we do experience um, similar, like some of our issues are, might be slightly different because of who we are as an individual, but there is a common, I guess, issue in, in terms of the stigma of living with a stutter. So it's important to come together and support each other as we go through our own varied experiences. Yes, how cool. Now, what if people want to find out more about Miss Jalisa Bygrave? How can they reach you via either email or Twitter or your website or your practice? Give me all of your information. <laughs> yeah, so um, in terms of my um, website for my private practice that I'm starting up, it's called Your Voice Speech Challenges Counseling. And the website U URL is speechchallengescounseling.com. I also am on Instagram, so go to instagram.com slash speech challenges to find me there. Um, my Instagram is, page is also on my website too as well. And then my email is speechchallengescounseling at gmail.com. Um, I hope to hear from many of you after this interview and look forward to further connecting. That is awesome. Thank you for spending time with me and and I know I know that this is not our last conversation because oh. I have many 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 more questions to toss your way and get your take on and so down the road let's do this again because you you are just amazing you I mean I think you are just awesome and so i want to just thank you one more time because i am appreciative of everybody who comes on this podcast because other people who stutter they are downloading this podcast and they are just learning techniques skills some golden nuggets to just help them with their struggle and so i just want to say thank you again and I hope you have an awesome day. Thank you so much for having me on the show. It's been an absolute pleasure um, being a guest, and I'm honored that you had asked me to do this. So thank you so much from the bottom of my heart as well. There you have it. If you like this podcast, head on over to Apple iTunes, subscribe, rate, and review. You can follow me on all of my social media with my stuttering life. Thank you for listening, and we will talk again. The podcast you just heard was made using Anchor. Ever thought about making your own podcast? Anchor makes it really easy for anyone to get started. It's a one-stop shop for recording, hosting, and distributing podcasts. Best of all, it's 100% free. Sign up now at anchor.fm slash new. That's anchor.fm slash new to get started.